So that's been my premise. I'm a skeptic for, in the true sense of the word. I, a skeptic is somebody who doesn't believe the prevailing school of thought and lets the evidence speak for itself in the definition of skeptic. So my feeling has always been, you know, if one person has a near-death experience and they say they saw Jesus, let's say, as in uh, the book by Todd Burpo, Heaven is for Real. He was five years old, he had a near-death experience, he came back, he said to his dad as a Christian minister, Dad, I saw Jesus. The father was like, yes, son, you saw Jesus. I saw guardian angels. Oh, that's nice. And I saw Aunt Betty, and, and she was with her son Larry. Now, the kid would never have known these details. And he went on and on and on about the family history and, and what she told him and all this stuff. So the father wrote this book, Heaven is for Real, and it was a bestseller. Even Alexander had also had a near-death experience. The difference is he's a Harvard professor. But he also had an experience that was very profound, going into another realm and seeing other things that he couldn't possibly know. So my point is, if you get two or three people who see the same thing, if you can ask them questions, doesn't it make sense to do so? Because it'll advance the knowledge of why we're on the planet. Okay, that was my premise. So when I heard that Michael Newton had written this book that 7,000 people under deep hypnosis had said the same things about the afterlife, I thought, like any skeptic would, either he's lying or he doesn't realize he's leading the clients or it's true. I couldn't find another possible answer for it. So I contacted the Newton Institute and I said, you know, could I shoot a documentary about Michael Newton? They said, no, 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 Michael's retired. He doesn't do any interviews anymore. Okay, um, can I come to your conference and film, you know, interview people there? Yeah, sure, do that. You can do that. So I flew to Chicago, my hometown, and I met Michael Newton. And he could see instantly that I wasn't there to debunk him or disprove him. I was curious, like, what's going on? So he gave me his last interview, a two-hour interview. And then I interviewed his wife. She was there. I thought, perfect, as a skeptic, perfect way to prove something, you know, corroborate a detail that he said, right? Very simple. So I said this question, um, tell me, Peggy, wonderful person, what did you think when your husband came home and said this about there being other, a life between lives? Not just past lives, but lives between lives. I'll tell you about that in a second. And she said, I thought he was nuts. I thought they were gonna take my husband away and put him in a mental institution until I heard the tapes, she said. Once she heard the tapes, clients coming from all over the world to meet him, to do these sessions, and to say the same things about the afterlife, the same things about the journey, she realized he must be onto something. And so he spent 30 years cataloging 7,000 cases before he wrote or told anyone about it. He didn't tell any colleagues because he was afraid somebody would influence <coughs> his questions. He wouldn't go into a bookstore for fear a title of a book would influence his questions. I thought that was an odd detail, and I asked her, she corroborated that as well. All right, so how do I come here? How do I, and this is really the reason I'm here. It's not just that I'm a filmmaker who happened to fall upon this topic and, and document it. Once I started documenting this and started realizing what they were saying was accurate, and I did two sessions myself, and had the same experience everybody else did, then it all fell into place. The whole dang journey. Which really begins, the flip side journey for me begins on a friend's deathbed. And lifelong friend, 20 years we had been together. Met her in film school, she's a famous actress, Luana Anders, she had done 30 films, two months she was an indie writer, a lot of movies. We just met and like we were old friends. And for 20 years we were very close, very together, she got cancer, she was dying. I was helping her with her journey as best as I could. And for those of us who've had that gift of being there when somebody passes on, you know it's easily the most difficult thing you can experience in life, but also the most life-enhancing thing you can experience. Because it really talks about what we're doing here. So, I'm with my friend, Lou. Brought her a cappuccino, reading the Sunday paper. She says to me, ah, you know, I think I'm going to another galaxy. Excuse me? 
I have this recurring dream. I'm in another galaxy, uh, and, and I'm in a classroom, and everyone's dressed in white, and they're talking about something deeply spiritual, and they're speaking a language I've never heard before, but somehow I completely understand. I thought, okay, that's the morphine drip. <laughs> it's gotta be. But then, when she passed, a friend of hers called me and said, I had the most amazing dream about the water last night. She was in the fourth dimension, she said. And she was in a classroom. And everyone was dressed in white. And she was like sitting in the front row and she seemed really happy. And I said, classroom, what? Did she tell you about her? No, she never told her about a dream about being in a class. I told the nurse about it, she went, oh my God, that was her recurring dream. That was the thing she kept talking about, this classroom. <laughs> in my mind, it was like, well, I'm never getting in that university. I don't have the credits to get in there. I mean, how do you get into that class? I knew that Luana had been a Buddhist, a lifelong Buddhist, and I thought, well, maybe Buddhism has some kind of a, you know, a way to get you into that class. I mean, if I'm going to see her again at some point, if that's a possibility, well then, you know, I better learn how to do that. Okay. Charles Grodin, the famous actor, writer, reporter, etc., etc., playwright, friend, called me up and he said, I need you to come and produce my show in New York, produce segments for my show. So I flew out to New York, and on the plane there, I saw, read this article by Robert Thurman. You may have heard of him. He's Uma Thurman's dad. He was the first Western Tibetan monk back in the 1960s, and then he met Timothy Leary's wife and married her and had five kids, and Uma was one of them. Okay, I digress. But... In the article, Robert is talking about how he had a Tibetan professor for many, many years, and how the professor, the, you know, the, the Toku, the, the uh, I should remember the names, the uh, Geshe, his teacher, had died and reincarnated somewhere in, in India, and people knew who he was, and so Bob went to visit the, his old teacher without telling him he was coming. Literally knocked on the door in Dharamsala, they opened up the door and he said, can I see the Rinpoche? And they said, sure, he's playing in the garden. So he went out to the garden and there was this little kid, five-year-old, on a tricycle, riding in a circle. Bob said he sat down and watched him for a while and the kid kept riding, kept riding, looked at him, rode over to him, stopped and said, Thurman, why did you leave the monkhood? You so disappointed me. And Bob said the kid's face looked like his teacher, grilling him. <laughs> he used to grill him. You know, and, and so Bob said, I, I felt I needed to become a professor. I would help spread the Dharma, etc." And the, the kid seemed satisfied with the answer and rode away. So I'm reading this article on the plane. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy probably knows how to go find Luana. He wrote a book, tra translated a book called The Tibetan Book of the Dead. Tibetans know about the dead. I mean, there's nobody I know in Western science who knows about the dead or spirits or any of that stuff. So if it's possible she's still out there, this is the guy. So I contacted Thurman. I said, can I audit your class over at Columbia while I'm doing this TV show? He said, no. It's a, it's a doctoral class and it's in philosophy. And how familiar are you with Hegel and Kant? And I said, they play for the 49ers. <laughs> and he said, all right. You can audit my class. So I went to this class, and I didn't understand a word he was saying. It was way over my head. But I went to all the classes, because I wanted to learn. And then I went to India with Bob, and I filmed the documentary in, in India with Bob. And then I went to Tibet with Bob, and we filmed the documentary there as well. I became his friend. And, and I was curious, but you know, honestly, I went deep, deep, deep into the Tibetan philosophy about the afterlife. And it, in a nutshell, it's this, that when you die, you are a wisp of smoke. Ultimately, you go through all the stages, and then you get to the very end, and you're the smoky thing. And depending upon your karma, your past life actions, that's where you wind up in your next life. So if you were a good person, you might have a higher birth. If you're not so good, a little lesser birth. They usually use that term, lesser birth, higher birth. If you're really a bad person, you might be a snake. Lesser, lesser, lesser birth. You know, you've heard, maybe many of you heard that. That's kind of the, the philosophical thing about reincarnation in many religions. Newton's research is contrary to that. Diametrically opposed. But I didn't know that at the time. I was just interested in learning. 
But I'd had an experience once. I had a near-death experience. I didn't know it was a near-death experience. I like to call it a near-life experience. But I had my own experience. And I was in my apartment in Santa Monica. You haven't heard this story. My apartment in Santa Monica. And I had a terrible cold. And I laid down to take a nap. And I felt myself dissolving into a sea of atoms. And I felt like this shimmering golden atoms all, over, all around me. I was like this just blissful. And the feeling was overwhelming bliss of feeling connected to everything in the universe, that connectedness. But I was aware of it, which is contrary to the Tibetan philosophy that between or after life, you're, you're not a, a, like a finite self. You're just like this wisp of smoke. But I was aware of it, rich. I'm rich as air going, wow, look at this golden thing that I'm floating around. And then I was aware that I was in a sea, like water. Like all the molecules in the universe were like this pool. It was almost like the way a pool kind of drifts back and forth. And then I was aware that if like somebody had a negative energy in my direction, I could see it coming like a wave. But then I was also aware that I could counter it by having a positive thought. All of this, conscious of this kind of bizarre thing, and literally fighting to retain consciousness because it was so intense. Then I had the thought that anywhere someone had taken a photograph of me, they had captured time. Because of the way photographs are, they're magnetized. They had captured a piece of time. And I could easily travel to any photograph on the planet where I was in it. And I saw myself zipping to so-and-so's attic with a box of somebody's wallet, somebody's purse. And I saw the photographs of myself. And then I passed out. Then I woke up and I was like, what the? What was that? <laughs> okay, that was strange. You know, and then I didn't characterize it as a near-death experience. You know, maybe I thought, oh, maybe I died. Maybe I had that cold was so bad I died. You know, maybe that was a fantasy I created. That's what I thought. Okay. So now I'm in New York City working on the Charles Grogan Show. Chuck is a mutual friend of Luana's and mine. And at some point, Chuck says, have you heard about James Von Prague? Yeah, sure, yeah, he's the medium guy. He said, well, let's bring him on the show. Let's see if we can talk to Luana. Okay, how are we gonna do that? I mean, it's not fair, you know, you bring him on the show, and I would like to talk. So he says, well, you, you figure it out. So I was in Santa Monica, and uh, James Von Prague was in the set in New York City. And only Charles knew that I was going to call on a particular line. So when the time came, I called. James Van Prague picked up the phone. I said, I'm calling about a friend. He said, what's her name? I said, Luana. He said, oh, I can hear her laughter. She's laughing. OK. She's laughing about you. OK. She's laughing about a cocktail glass collection you have in your kitchen. Lots of cocktail glasses. You know my last name. People give me martini glasses all the time. I have a lot of martini glasses. Okay. He doesn't, but probably doesn't know my name. Then he says, there's a photograph on your refrigerator that's the essence of your relationship with this woman. Well, you know, talk about a ray going through you. When I put this photograph on that fridge, only once in my lifetime have I ever spoken to a photograph. And I said, that's the essence of our relationship. It's a picture of me and her in Italy, laughing, having a cappuccino and a cookie. And I took a selfie, you know, I stuck the camera out there. But I said it aloud, I said the words. Boom, like a lightning bolt. A verification, not for the planet, but for rich. Okay, Luana is somewhere. She can laugh. She can laugh at me. <coughs> Where? How do I get there? Who do I talk to? Do I gotta wear a spacesuit? <laughs> what am I gonna do? So, I kid you not, another month or so later, I'm in New York City, working on the Grogan Show, living in the Upper West Side, and as I laid down, late afternoon, kind of tired, you know, up all night, I had an out-of-body experience. Anybody have one of those? Okay, a couple of you guys. You know what it's like. Usually you fly around the room. Sometimes there's other people saying, hey, come on, let's go. And you're, you're conscious of it. My brother had a near-death experience. He told me after he read my book. 
He was killed uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia, while on maneuvers by an army of red ants. They, they bit him, stung him, and he died. And they airlifted him to the hospital. He saw the whole thing. And he saw his body being put on the slab, you know, on the hospital slab, on the hospital bed. And they gave him the adrenaline shot. Boom, and he came back. I'd never heard that, but he was floating around watching it. So people, most people have that out-of-body experience, floating around. You know, maybe there's a specific you know, place you go or see or someone you see. But in my case, this particular case, I'm rocketed out of my body right into deep space. And I saw New York disappear below me. I saw Manhattan, you know, like in the movies, where it's kind of zip. And now I was hurtling through deep space, and it was inky black, but I could see the lights of the stars going around me. So that meant I was going at a high rate of speed. I mean, they were melting. The light was like melting, like in a Star Trek episode, around me. And then I suddenly took a right turn, or a, what is that, 90 degree turn. And I moved through something that felt like a, I want to say a, a wormhole, because I saw the movie Contact years later. And it was like, oh, that was it. That was exactly it, like bouncing around. And when I came out on the other side, I was still traveling at the same rate of speed, but not going this way, going this way. I only mention it because that's what happened. That was my experience of what was going on. And then I stopped, and there she was, standing in front of me, her eyes closed. And she opened her eyes, as if to say, you were looking for me. And at that moment, some knucklehead outside my, car, outside my apartment window honked his truck horn. <laughs> The weird thing is, before his hand came off the truck horn, I traveled backwards, like a rubber band pulling me back. All that distance, that fast. And I saw New York coming at, up at me, like, you know, at a high rate of speed, and then boom, I was awake. Wow, what the heck was that? I saw her, okay, all right, all right, all right. How do I get back there? Do I have to put on a spacesuit? Do I need oxygen? Do I, uh, do I have to consult somebody? How do I do that? So I, that was kind of my thought. And, and through a weird sequence of events, a um, friend of mine, a professor at Oxford University, his daughter died suddenly. And, she, and he wrote to me and was telling me how tragic you know, he felt and how, how bad he felt, as anyone would. And I wrote him a letter saying, I don't know if you've seen the work of uh, Carol Bowman or Ian Stevenson, where they talk about reincarnation at University of Virginia. Carol Bowman wrote a book called Children's Past Lives, where she scientifically interviews a number of kids who remember like being in the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera. And I, was, I sent him those books, you know, sort of to help him through this tragedy. And he wrote me back and said, are you familiar with Michael Newton's work? I was like, no, I am I'm not. And I forgot to mention that I had met him in London. I went back to, I was in London, and when I shook his hand, I was there for another reason, like a TV show. And when I shook Robert Beer's hand, I had the sensation of like, oh, this is why I'm here. I'm here to meet this guy. I mean, I was conscious of that thought. Oh. Now, I didn't know why. But then here, these six months later, this letter comes. And then he says, have you read about Michael Newton? So I, I started this documentary. Because I read the book, and I was like, oh, this is really an interesting documentary. And I filmed Michael Newton, and then I called Robert. I said, hey, you know, I think you could see your daughter if you do one of these sessions. And he says, God, it's so weird you'd call me right now. I've been talking to like the top psychics in, in England. They don't get they don't pay. They don't they don't charge money for their work over there. They try to keep it on that level. So the best ones, you just have to find them, you have to wait in line. But he had found somebody. And they all said, No, I can't reach your daughter for some reason. My guides, they literally do this. And they won't speak, what one guy said. So I said, why don't, why don't, why don't you do a session with a Michael Newton trained hypnotherapist? Me. Okay. So he goes to London, he has this session, and he spends an hour with his daughter. She shows him the many lives they had together. And I say it in this way because that's the feeling he had. I could argue, oh, you're making it up. You're projecting it. To him, as he said, as much as talking to you is reality, holding your hand is reality, looking you in the eye is reality, that's the way it felt with my daughter. I saw her, I talked to her, she made me laugh, she pointed out my foibles, 
She told me about things I didn't know that later on turned out to be true, etc., etc. Wow, that's great. But he said something else happened. In my past life review, I remembered a lifetime in Boston in 1840, married to a girl that I know in this lifetime. And in that lifetime, I saw her as like the love of my life. And when she died, I was desperate and I committed suicide. But it was Boston, 1840, and he described all these things in Boston where I went to school. So he'd never been there. So it was odd that he knew all these things, but you know, not scientific. But I said, hold on a second. Are you still friends with this woman? He said, yeah. Where does she live? On the East Coast. Would you do me a favor? Would you contact her and ask her if she'll do a session with a Michael Newton trained hypnotherapist? I'll choose them. Her, him, her. He was like, okay, I can do that. I chose the hypnotherapist, I chose the city. He had never heard anything about Robert Beer's session, nothing in print, anywhere. And she had never heard anything about Robert Beer's session. And she went to New York City and had this Michael Newton trained hypnotherapist, Paul Oren, who was the president of the Newton Institute for a long time. He did the session. She had the identical past life memory. 1840, married to this guy as a banker. So when I talk to scientists, and Bruce Grayson, you know, he's a, one of the founding members of the International Association of Near-Death Studies. It's the University of Virginia. I had this conversation with him. Because they don't really consider hypnosis a valid scientific tool. I pointed out this case, because if they don't uh, account for what happened, that you had a past life, modern science thinks, oh, you're, you're somehow in the Jungian unconscious. Somehow you're picking up somebody else's life. You're just tapping into something else. That's the, the theory that they have, okay? Or it's cryptomnesia, they call it. Meaning you heard it, you saw it in a movie, you're under deep hypnosis, and you're like, yeah, I'm Cleopatra. <laughs> No, no, I'm on a Titanic. Yeah, I'm there too. Yeah, that's right. I'm clear picture and I'm on the Titanic. But you can't have two people have a past life memory that's identical on two different continents with two different hypnotherapists without it being true. Okay. So that, for me, was like a great verification of the research that I was on the right path. So while I went to the Institute, so now I'm going to go back to the Institute. I'm interviewing Michael Newton. I'm interviewing his wife. And then they say, how do you like to do some of the sessions? Would you like to film like some past life regression? Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this process, person is under hypnosis, but for those of you who are familiar with hypnosis, you're never under anything. It's like a guided meditation. You are just relaxed. They ask you questions. The only thing they ask, insist that you do is say whatever comes to your mind. Because otherwise you do a lot of this and then tears and saying, oh my God, you know, so they want you to say, what is it? What are you saying? I mean, that happens a lot. What are you saying? And you have to allow yourself, it's hard. You have to allow yourself to say whatever it is that's in front of you. And then they can ask you questions like, what is it? Let's examine it. So the process is that you go through the first hour or so, you go through your life. You go back to a memory when you were 10, 11 years old, let's say. And in my case, I remembered my finger being cut. And I like sliced off my finger. And you know, I was like, oh, this is not a memory I want to have. But you know, there's the blood. And then I see my father who passed away. And now I'm feeling this emotion of my dad. Oh my god, my dad's going to save me. This is great. So I had the emotions of a 12-year-old. That's my point. Then we went back to, they go, and in this case, well, let's go back to your first memory. I remember being born. I saw the doctor's face, clearly, his hazel eyes. I saw that goofy metal thing they used to have on their heads back in the 50s. The, you know, the thing in his head, the mask. I asked my mother afterwards. I had said during the session, my dad's not here, but he's on his way. So I asked mom, where was dad when I was born? I thought he was in the waiting room. She said, no, 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 he's driving there. He was on his way there. Okay. So then they ask you for a previous life that has some significance in this lifetime. Okay? It's the same thing Brian Weiss does. Some significance to this lifetime is the key sentence. So what you remember is the thing that is closest to who you are now, or has some effect of who you are now. 
It's not random. It's not just any old person. So, um, in the case of this woman, so I'm filming at this conference, and this woman, it's her, uh, said they've agreed to do a demonstration, okay, for all the hypnotherapists so they can learn how the process. And Michael Newton is standing off to the side, or writing notes on a whiteboard, and Paul Oren was doing the session. The woman was a hypnotherapist from Sedona. Anybody wants to go see a new trained hypnotherapist? She's fantastic. She's in the book. Um, easy to find. Chanda Berlatsky. Fantastic. But anyway, I had never met her. I'm sitting there with my camera, dubious, skeptic. Start filming. Paul Oren goes through her this life, and now he says, let's go to a previous life that has some significance on this, on this current life. And she remembers being naked in a shower with other naked women. And as she starts to describe where she is, the audience realizes she's in Auschwitz. And she's describing the last moments of that life. And now in these sessions, they go, well, let's go back to an earlier time. You know, some time when you were with your family and happy. So she went back to Warsaw, Anna Paczynski. I was able to verify this woman's name and where she was from and her family, because it's in the records now. You can do that. Anna Paczynski and whole family got wiped out. And now she goes through the death process and gives details about that death process that I had never heard before, but I could research the smell of the gas, the way it smelled. It's not common knowledge, but it's not like she looked it up, you see? So now she goes to the life between lives, and there everyone meets their guardian angel, or they meet their spirit guide. And you see, there's always one, and there might be two. There might even be three. But everybody has one. So a spirit guide's in the audience, I'm addressing you. <laughs> Everybody has one. And when usually when a client is under deep hypnosis and sees this spirit guide for the first time, they're blown away. That's my teacher. That's who I've been with my every lifetime. It's a very emotional moment, as this woman had. And you know, and when you're here, there's a veil of something that keeps us from remembering this stuff. And then she goes with him, and he takes her to a healing center. That's a common place that people go to, especially if they had a difficult death. And the healing centers are, are like a place where you connect with the energy that you left behind. And this is what all the 7,000 people say. Only a third of your energy is here. Two-thirds of you are back there, keeping an eye on you, doing stuff, playing tiddlywinks, I don't know, whatever they're doing, going to classes. Okay? I forgot to mention when I picked up Michael Newton's book, Journey of Souls, the first chapter was about a classroom. Somebody remembered a classroom, everyone was dressed in white. So I realized, oh, this is the guy I should interview, you see? So classrooms, a very common theme, visiting a classroom. What happens in these classrooms? In general, they're teaching about some version of energy transformation. That's the way I described it in my session. I went to two classrooms. But before we get to my classroom, there's this woman with her spirit guide. They go to visit her soul group. It's what they commonly call it, but her soul group, is, everybody has one. <laughs> you might not think so. Anywhere from 3 to 25 people, the average is 15. How do you know who they are? Consider the people you know in your life that you went, oh, God, I feel like I've known this person forever. Impossibility. Sometimes your significant other. Sometimes. Oh, when I saw him the first time, I felt like I was home. I've heard that many times. When he kissed me the first time, I knew I was going to marry him. When I saw him on television being interviewed, I knew I'd marry him. I've heard that. I ask that question to people who, who don't really want to hear about past lives, but I say, well, you know, just consider the moment you first met your significant other. Is there anything odd about it? And when you really examine it, that person who changed your heart, changed your life, stopped you in your tracks, sometimes people go, I felt nauseous. One woman said, I was nauseous. I said, why were you nauseous? I just knew I would never be with another man. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> but that common theme, that is a theme that runs through all of these sessions. A life planning session Picture that. 
where you're with your soul group and you're sitting around going, okay, what are we gonna do? Who are you gonna play? Like actors. I'm gonna play your alcoholic mother. No, 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 please, you did that in the Viking era. You're too good at it. <laughs> somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else wanna play that part? Come here. People report these sessions, life planning sessions, as dramatic and weird as I'm saying it, that's what they report. They report that the stones in your past, in your life, the difficulties you've had, you may have agreed to them. You may have asked that person, no, you've got to be, you've got to hit me. Because if you don't hit me, I'll never leave you, and I'll never find the person I'm supposed to be with. You've got to do that for me, okay? I'm just telling you, this is not me, it's not a philosophy. This is in the research, what people say, including a woman who is in the Holocaust, who's now talking to her spirit guides, and she's asking the question, why? Why would I choose such a difficult life? I lost everyone, everything I loved. I don't understand, I don't get it. Why would I do that? And then they showed her images, as she said. They're showing me images, oh, this is gonna be very hard for me to say. But they're showing me that it was harder to choose to play the role of a perpetrator in this life than a victim. What? Easily the most politically incorrect thing I've ever heard. And you know, I'm just starting this movie, I've just interviewed this Michael Newton guy, I've interviewed his wife, and now I'm filming my first session, and my brain stopped. I shot up from the camera, what did she just say? It was harder to play the role of a perpetrator than a victim. And then she said, from my perspective, every day was a lesson in loyalty. It was a lesson in courage. It was a lesson in forgiveness, a lesson in being human. They were heightened lessons. They were incredibly difficult lessons. But from where I was, instead of being a person who inflicted pain, and hurt people and had to engender and suffer from those things, it was easier to be the person who gave that lesson to someone else. Blew my mind. Next day I filmed some woman who had severe aquaphobia. Couldn't swim. So she wanted to examine in her session, like what's up with the swimming thing? And she had whispered that, I didn't hear it, to the hypnotherapist. She's a hypnotherapist. You know, she said, I want to examine this thing. I don't like this one. Quickly went into 1887. She was a sailor uh, on a German ship. The ship had run aground, and the captain had thrown her off overboard, and she was drowning. And she drowns while I'm filming her. And I was, like, freaking out. She's choking and gasping and coughing. She can't breathe. And she's swearing at the captain because she feels like he is enjoying this, she's saying. He's here, he's enjoying watching me die. Furious, swearing like a sailor. It's very unusual. And then the hypnotherapist helps her rise up to examine it. And she says, oh, oh, wait a second, I see, oh, I was like a, I was like a bad person. The ship had run aground and we had run out of food and I was stealing food from all the other comrades and so they voted to throw me off. That was a perspective to see. And then she said, I see the captain coming to me right now. He's holding my hands and he's saying, you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in this lifetime. She said, oh, I saw it. It was a contract. I had asked him to do that. Then she said, he's my father. He's my father in this lifetime. And she saw in that moment how when she was three, she knew that she had drowned off a raft in a, in a lake, but she didn't know who saved her. And then she saw the captain saving her. Now listen, people could be making this up. It's possible. I grant it. People could be making all of it up. It's also possible we could be making up the fact that we're right here today, as you know. <laughs> That's a philosophical you know, quandary. But all I can tell you is, under deep hypnosis, this woman cured her aquaphobia because I filmed her swimming like a month later. So I began filming these sessions over and over and over again. Okay? And then they said, Rich, dude, you're doing all this filming. Why don't you, uh, why don't you do one? And I thought, oh, I can't, I can't do a session. I'm, 
I'm the guy. I'm the journalist. I'm filming this. I, I can't. I, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. This is an opportunity for me to prove this is fake. Great. If they're manipulating me, you saw that guy at the beginning, a hypnotist, and doing like this. <laughs> If they're doing this thing and they're waving the clock, you know, I'm over here going, no, you're not. You want me to go somewhere? I'm not going there because I have not come with a prevailing problem, you see. I have not gone to see a hypnotherapist because I'm injured or wounded or hurt or sad or anything. I'm a jaded, you know, Hollywood dude who happens to be in Chicago filming this thing. So, great. It's a perfect opportunity for me to prove they're wrong. And I determined no matter what this guy says to me in this session, I am going to say, if I don't see something, I'm, I'm not going to say, I see it. I also thought I could never be under hypnosis. Not possible. I was, you know, belaboring into the thought that you go under. You're out. I didn't know, I wasn't aware. You know, it's just like I've done guided meditations. That, you know, it's fun. So this was the same. So this was a four-hour session. As I said, I went back through my life. We went to a previous life that has some, he goes, let's go to a previous life. What do I see? <coughs> Nothing. I see this, blackness. I, I'm not looking, I don't see anything. He goes, okay, just, you know, just relax, relax. Go deeper. What do you see? Nothing. Okay, let's just, you know, why don't you just relax a little bit? And uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I don't see anything. And I'm thinking I'm not gonna see something because he wants me to. That's my thing. And then he's very clever because this is a guy who's done it a lot. He says, well, Rich, it's okay. Just look down. Okay. Ah, I see something. That's funny. I see feet. I see two naked feet. Oh, they're in a river, a creek of some sort, and they're kind of cut up. That's funny. Oh, I'm cooling off my feet in a creek. All right. I've gone that far, and I've allowed myself to say that. He says, what are you wearing? Buckskin, and then I saw him, I had like a pull back. I saw him, I said, oh, I'm an American Indian. And then I laughed. Oh, come on, Rich. Really? That's what you're going to come up with? You're going to create an American Indian? You know, feathers and all that stuff. But I saw myself as this tall guy with long hair and feathers stuck in his hair. And he says, uh, so who are you? What do you do? And I said, well, I'm a medicine man in the Lakota tribe. And I went, oh, come on. <laughs> like The conscious mind mocking me. But the subconscious mind, because I've agreed to speak, I speak, even though I'm allowing myself to mock me So at the same time. <laughs> and he says, what's your name? And I said, ah, oh, it sounds like Tatanka. Now, I saw Dances with Wolves. He's in Lakota land. A Tatanka is a buffalo. I know that. But I also said, it's not Tatanka. It sounds like Tatanka. It's Watanka. Something like that. And I'm thinking, dude, if you're going to make this up, like, be straight about it. You know, come on. <laughs> you're going to come up with a scenario, like, at least know where the scenario is going. Okay. He said, uh, can we go to your tribe? I said, I don't really want to do that right now. And conscious mind going, what, you're being you know, reluctant? And then I saw why. I was standing in a place where Indians live. I forget what you call it. Now a camp. And they're all dead. They'd all been massacred. There's blood everywhere. Smoke, blood, massacre scene. And I walked over to the teepee, which I seemed to know was mine. And I felt the skin, I could feel it, as I opened it. And I saw this woman lying on the floor. And I said, they've killed my wife and taken my son. And I felt the emotion of that, of that sentence. My conscious mind is saying, how could you feel this? Oh my God, what an emotion. God forbid any one of us ever in any lifetime has that feeling. But there was no boy there. There was just a woman. Where did I come up with they've taken my son? But I felt it. I mean, and I started to sob. And I was just going through the sobbing. I'm like, oh my God. And my conscious mind is going, we are really feeling this. Whatever it is, you know, maybe this is good for you. Whatever it is, I don't know. And then he said, who did this? And I said, it was the goddamn Huron. And I was like, wait a minute. Huron, they're in upstate New York. I mean, I know that much, you know, and the Lakota are out there in Montana, Wyoming, whatever. So I'm always, I'm mocking myself, let's just say, you know, but I'm feeling it. 
Yeah, I'm experiencing it. I'm, you know, and I was thinking like maybe this is what everybody does. And then we went to the last day of that lifetime, and I said, well, I'm drunk, and I'm carrying a whiskey bottle, and I'm going to drown myself, I'm in, like around the Mississippi or something. And I just went to this big muddy river and watched myself climb in and bob down the river like a cork. Hypnotherapist said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, how are you feeling? Is that okay? I said, are you kidding me? They took everything. They took my family, my religion, my people. Everything I believed in is gone. I am just a shell. I want to go home. Now that's a recurring sentence. I'd only filmed a couple, but it's a recurring sentence. People, when they remember their death experience, say, ah, I want to go home. Now I said that sentence, and I, as a screenwriter, I was going, oh, that was good writing. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's funny you would say that, you know, family gone and everything. Clever. But I didn't really believe it, okay? Let me pause in this thought for a second. Cut to six months later, I'm at a funeral in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. My dear aunt had passed away. And I'm talking to her son, who I haven't seen in some time. And I say, Coin, Irish, what are you doing? He said, uh, I'm, um, I'm like a historian for an Indian tribe. But really? That's odd. What tribe? Lakota. <laughs> really? How did this happen? He told me the whole story. When he was 17, he met these Lakota, and they adopted him into their tribe. Like secretly. Not something you do. So he learned their ways. And he knew their myths, and he knew their stories. And so I said, hold on a second. You're not going to believe this, but I had this, and I just want to call it, you know, like maybe it was a past, I don't know what it was, but, you know, I had this thing, and I did this session, and here's what I said. He said, hold on, hold on, hold on, Rich. What were you wearing? I said, I was wearing buckskin. He said, did you have feathers? I said, yeah. He said, How, uh, were they up or down? And he did that. Were they up? <laughs> I said, no, they were down. He said, how many? I said, two. He said, oh, well, that means you were a medicine man. Oh, okay. Um, well, then why did I call myself Watanka? He laughed. <laughs> that would have been your name. Watantanka means the Great Spirit. Guys who work for the Great Spirit are Watanka. Uh, you can't look that up. You can't look up Watanka. You can look up Watantanka, because that means Great Spirit, Lakota. Okay, okay, <laughs> hold on a second. What about this thing about the Huron killing my tribe? He said, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years. Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Couldn't look it up, couldn't be Kryptonesia. Okay? I honor that just because it's not detail that I could not find anywhere else. And I know, I can tell you now, it's an unusual thing. You know, I poll people who do this kind of therapy and they say, like, how many people are you getting that have this? And even in my own small sampling of 20, 30 people, I've got like five or six or seven people who remember past lives as American Indians. One session, I give a book talk like this, and a woman sitting in the front row burst into tears when I said they were all massacred. Sort of sobbing. I, thank God I was with a hypnotherapist who, instead of ignoring her, said, can I help you? And so he does a live demonstration. It's on YouTube. He does a live demonstration of a life between life therapy, abbreviated, it's about a half an hour, and he takes her to a past life memory where she was an American Indian and her tribe was massacred in West Virginia and she was in charge of burning their clothes. Why? Does anybody know why? Because you can't go back to the great spirit unless your clothes are burned. You can't become a phoenix until the ashes are there. She was in charge of burning the clothes so their spirits could return. And the more I do this research, the more I hear the Native American words. Everything is animated with spirit. So for example, um, I, so I did my session. I, I ended up transcribing my session and about 20 other sessions into this book. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to catalog them. And I realized they're so close to near death experiences. People have the past life review. So I got to my past life review. I, I went to my soul group. I went to my past life review. I saw a council of elders. I didn't think I would get there. They had told me write out a few questions. I had come up with like 10 questions. And then I, I asked you know, my intimate and funny and kind of bizarre questions because I never thought I'd get there. And one of the questions was, why 
did I choose Rich Martini? And what I heard myself say was, every thought, action, word, or deed contains, and by the way, when you're under hypnosis, you talk really fast. You'd think you'd talk slower, but no, you're like this. Like, it's all right there, all the access, all the information. Every thought, action, word, or deed contains energy. So when you paint a painting, when you write a song, when you write a poem, when you write a book, you're putting your energy into that creative act, and it goes out into the universe like a quantum wave, and it affects people you may never see. You've heard of the quantum butterfly effect? So the good that you do now may help and heal somebody further along. The reason you chose Rich is because other lifetimes you've been a healer, you've been a medicine man, you've done all these things, you were trying to heal people with your hands, your thoughts, your words. This is a case you could use film, music, dialogue to heal people. Really? And then I said, it's just a shame I didn't pick somebody who was more successful at it. <laughs> and the hypnotherapist laughed, and so did my counsel. So I had the weird moment of experiencing laughter on two planes. You know, la they're laughing and he was laughing. But that's why I chose to be rich, so that I could pass along that energy. So subsequently, I continued filming. After the book's been done, I'm still filming people. Friends of mine call me up, they go, yeah, I wanna try this. I filmed a person two weeks ago, severe Parkinson's. Michael J. Fox Parkinson's, okay? really has ruined her career. She was a screenwriter, wrote a couple of big movies, and can't work anymore, can't teach, can't drive, all this stuff. I said to her, you know, let's just see if this will have any effect. Kid you not? I mean, she took her medicine that day, so this might have been the effect, but under deep hypnosis, she did not have Parkinson's. She, her spirit guide said to her, here's where it began, not in a previous life, in this life, she had an affair with a married man 20 years ago. That was a big, dark secret for her, and it changed her physiologically. She stopped getting the vitamins that she was supposed to get. It affected her brain. So the Parkinson's effects are there. It's not that you can take them away, but now she sees the path to taking them away the vitamin therapy, all the stuff that she needs to do, exercise, etc., etc. Not drugs, but she saw the path in her session, okay? And when she came out of that session, the Parkinson's came out. I heard on film, and it'll be in the next book. But look, the point is not you can cure anything, but you can certainly examine things from a different perspective. And, and I'll, this one woman, said to me, Rich, I want to go do one of these sessions, these Life Between Life sessions. Really? You're like a film producer. Why would you want to do that? You don't believe in this stuff. I don't. I'm an atheist. I don't believe anything you've told me. I don't believe you can be hypnotized. I don't believe there's any between lines. I don't believe it. Okay, so why do you want to do this? She says, well, I have a tumor on my ovary, and I'm having an operation next week, and if there's any way I can help affect the healing process, talking to my subconscious, I'm in. Okay. So we drove out to uh, Scott DeTamble's office in Claremont, lifebetweenlives.com. Scott's, I've been working with him quite a bit. Very talented hypnotherapist in California. And when we got out there, you know, I'm waiting to see if she's gonna go under hip, but boom. She goes under hypnosis, she's living in Flagstaff. It's 1820, actually not like some, some obscure town in Arizona. It's 1820, she's an old man, uh, she's married, she's an old man, he's married a young girl, and the young girl convinces him to drive her out the buckboard out of the desert, and then the girl says, hey, give me some water, would you? And the guy climbs out of the buckboard, and then she rides away with the horse. <laughs> Leaves him to die. And now we've caught him in the last moments of his life. And then, you know, he's swearing and cranky and all this other stuff, and then he dies, you know, before he can get to the, you know, the lizard. The last thing he's looking at is a lizard looking at him, you know, like, oh, he dies. And then the hypnotherapist says, Scott says, so what now it's happening? And she says, I'm stepping out of the body. I can see myself. I'm this young, vibrant spirit. And I'm dancing up and down. I'm, I'm jumping up and down. I'm dancing. I'm really happy. <laughs> Very unusual. 
And Scott says, oh, why? And she says, I always wanted to be a cranky old man, and I finally did it. <laughs> you know, I'm over in the corner with my jaw dropped. What? We choose roles on stage as weird as those are? You know, I think I'll be a cranky old man. All right. That's what she says. Now she goes back into the life between lives. She sees her soul group. They're playing a game of cosmic tag, she says. And in cosmic tag, everyone can be invisible. And you have to capture all six of your loved ones at the same time, even though they're invisible. What? And then she says, oh, and the twist is they can be in any realm. <laughs> I was like, OK, OK, wait a minute. Shut the camera off. What? What did you say? What, what, what? OK. So now we get to her question. And she, as a skeptic, didn't have any. We were driving out there. I said, you don't have any questions? No, I don't believe I'm going to get anywhere. I said, well, let's just ask some questions just in case, you know. Well, what am I going to ask? I said, well, just imagine if you could talk to God. What would you ask God? OK. So now we get to her questions. I don't know what they are. First question is, what up, what's up with my tumor? Is this going to be OK? Am I doing the right thing? We all want to hear stuff like that. Scott asks if he can talk directly to her spirit guide. Her spirit guide is like this curmudgeon who literally says, really, you got nothing better to do than ask me questions? You already know the answer to these questions. Yes, well, we have a few questions. Do you mind answering them? OK, all right, all right. What? This thing. She's having this, oh, it's fine. It's nothing. It's physical. Go, your doctors are great. Go get it taken care of. It's no big deal. The follow-up question, which I had given her, was, is there anything Scott can do or say to help you in the healing process? Spirit guide says, why? Is he a surgeon? <laughs> Didn't I just tell you? Your doctors are fine. I thought, oh my god. <laughs> the spirit guide mocking, mocking his protege. All right, here's her three questions. And this is our, our closing. Three questions were, is the universe a machine? That's one. She's a skeptic. She wants to know, is the universe a machine? Number two, what's the meaning of the shift? Back in 2012, people were talking about the Mayan calendar. There's going to be a shift in consciousness. And she thought that was nonsense. And so she just was like, what is that? What is the meaning of the shift? Number three, what or who is God? Well, I thought that's a great question. So answer the first question, is the universe a machine? Yes, he says. It's a mechanism. However, it's sentient. The universe functions as a mechanism. However, it's sentient. It learns, is what he's saying. We make a mistake. We learn something. The universe learns it. I, I'm not sure I can get my mind around it, but I understood it at that moment, anyway. Number two, what's the meaning of the shift? He says, you humans always feel the need to name things. <laughs> that was he going to attack us now? You know, but in terms of the cosmos, it's no big deal. However, if you want to understand a shift in consciousness, imagine yourself a crab walking on the ocean floor, and you open your eyes, and you see you're in an ocean. You realize you're in an ocean. That's a shift in consciousness. The ocean that I saw when I dissolved into consciousness, I understood it. We live in an ocean called oxygen. We don't see it, but we certainly don't treat it like it's something we should pal precious, do we? Water. We don't treat it like it's something that's precious, do we? We don't. But we're in it as an ecosystem. I understood that. The third thing, what or who is God? Oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> God, he says, is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's just not physically possible. And I thought, oh, he's ducking the question. But wait a minute. Not physically possible means it's beyond the capacity of the computer. I got that. OK. Oh, it's beyond our, our ability to comprehend something because the data is not there. We can't access that data. It's just not physically possible. However, he said, you can experience God. And I was like, oh my god, of course. You know, you can experience putting your hand in water. You can experience water. You can't tell anybody what it is. It's wet, it's silly, it feels weird, it's kind of liquidy. 
you can't really describe it to other humans in words that we have, but you can experience it. God, you can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. You can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. Not just your loved one. Everyone. So you can do that. Very hard to do. We spend all day television telling us who the good guys and bad guys are. We just live in good and bad all the time. That's not what he said. You want to experience God? Open your heart to everyone and to all things. Atoms, water, air, earth. Open your heart to it. And if your heart's open to something, you don't want to harm it, right? So the main thing of the reason that I took up this line of study, somebody asked me, why do you, why, why do you care? I said, you know, if one person can believe that reincarnation might exist as a possibility, wouldn't it make sense for us to take care of our air, our water, and the food we eat? Just for our own selfish purposes. Because if I'm coming back in 100 years, I'd like to be able to eat something or drink some fresh water. I mean, come on. So finally, to wrap it up, the reason I came here to Phoenix today was to talk about who we are, who our souls are, our energy system is. It is the Phoenix. And when we go to ashes, however we get there, we don't die. We rise up, or we rise out, or we rise into another. And if you could see ourselves from another perspective, we would be jeweled and golden and radiant and all that other stuff. And we go hang out with our soul group, and then we choose who we're going to be the next time, usually to learn or teach a lesson, and then we come back and do it again. Oh, the bell. Oh, is that what you were doing? Or were you ringing a bell? Um, he, he wants me to repent this. Story, but I, you know, I think I think uh, my son's story is probably a better wrap. That's where I'm at. Okay. Um, look, I'm Rich Martini. I'm standing in front of you. You never heard of me. You don't know who I am. I'm telling you these stories. You're like, okay, maybe, maybe, could be, whatever. But when I tell you a story about something that is verifiable about a family member, it gives it a little bit of a different thing. We've all had some weird experience in our life. All right, so I'm going to recount this one, and it's my son. Okay? My son was two. I'm on the phone with him. I'm in Chicago. I got started late. He's only eight now. My wife and I both got started late. He was two. I'm in Chicago visiting my mom. And he says, on the phone, you know, I, I, I got one word out of him using, love you. Okay, all right, okay. He says, Dad, I was a monk in Nepal. I said, put your mother on the phone. <laughs> Why did he say that? She, she goes, I had no idea. Were you reading a book, watching a show? I, no, we weren't. I don't know where that came from. It was like he'd been waiting to say it. Okay, all right, all right, whatever. So now, a year later, I'm driving around Santa Monica with him, and he's in the baby seat. You know, baby seats are always in the back seat. He's three. And I look at him in the rearview mirror, and I say, RJ, it's his name. RJ, did, uh, did you know Daddy before? He said, yeah. I said, where did you meet me? He said, Tibet. Where in Tibet? On the path. I'm thinking, is he saying a philosophical path of Tibetan Buddhism? I'm like, wow, that's way beyond a three-year-old scope. I'm like, what path, path? I was in Tibet. I shot a movie in Tibet. Oh, wait a minute. I was on Mount Kailash with Robert Thurman, circling the sacred mountain. You're supposed to go, I filmed this documentary for Tibet House, and on that mountain, Robert Thurman had said, if you make a wish in this spot, it'll come true. And I was going to wish for a million dollars. And then I couldn't make up my mind. I went, no, 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 I need a three-picture deal. <laughs> too, like, that's what I need. I mean, come on, Rich. Three million, three-picture deal, one million dollars. Three-picture deal, one million dollars. You know, it's up your high altitude. <laughs> Whatever comes out of my mouth, that's my wish. Out of my mouth came, I want a son. I literally didn't know who said that. I was like, what? We had a daughter. 
I wasn't like, oh, I must have sun. But I thought, oh, it must be a male thing, you know, this consciousness, oh, it's in my DNA, I must have reproduced male. <laughs> but I said it out loud, I want a son. I had forgotten about it, honestly. Except when my wife said she was pregnant. And I said, I know, it's a boy. Um, <laughs> so now I'm back in the car with her. And I say, do you mean Mount Kailash? And he says, no. Oh, a path in Tibet. I was on a lot of paths. Oh, wait a minute, do you mean Kangra? He said, yes, it was Kangra. Kangra is the name of the path that goes around my Ka Mount Kailash in Tibet. The place where I made that wish. But I said it. Was it Kangra? He agreed, as if he knew what he was talking about. Yeah, it's Kangra. Now, a year later, I'm working on that movie Soul in New York City. I've sublet an apartment in the village. My wife and kids have come to visit and stay here for a while, and you know, I'm on the set. And my wife calls me and she goes, You're not gonna believe what just happened. RJ went to the library of the guy's house and pulled two books out of the library, took one and threw it in the trash. And she said, what are you doing? He said, oh, that book is nonsense. <laughs> this is the important one. <coughs> Robert Thurman's book, Circling the Sacred Mountain. He opened it up, pointed to a picture of Mount Kailash, where I made the wish, and said, that's where I found Daddy. Kid didn't read. So my wife was like, did you show him this book? Did you tell him this story? Did you do it? I had never said the word Kailash to him other than that time in the car. I was equally freaked out. So now when he's five, we're at a, a store in uh, L.A. in Topanga Canyon. It's a, a Bhutanese shop. And the owner's Tibetan, and I'm there chit-chatting with him about all things Tibet, because I love Tibetan. And my wife comes up and says, um, RJ has disappeared. I say, what do you mean he disappeared? You mean like, poop? She said, no, I can't find him. And I said, oh, come on. It's like the store's like this room. He's got to be somewhere. He can't be far. You know, look under stuff. She comes back five minutes later, like, the look on her face, if I had only had a camera. You're not going to believe what I just saw. I said, what, what, what? She said, I went in the back, and there was this Tibetan music playing. Bells and horns and blasts and stuff. And he was standing in front of a mirror doing full prostration. You've seen him. Hand over head, the lips, the heart, all the way down to the ground. Touch your head to the ground, the forehead to the ground. You go back up, you do it again. <coughs> all the way, I can't even do it. I can't, I can't bend down. He's doing this over and she watches him for three minutes doing full prostrations like a monk would. And then he sees her in the mirror and he goes, oh, mom, like caught you know, doing his old past life stuff. He says, you know, you need to meditate more, and this is how you do it. Come here. And he pulls her down to the ground. And he says, you hear the music? You hear those bells? Whenever a bell is heard in Tibetan music, it means peace comes into the world. Now, she told me that, and I was like, peace comes into the world? I thought it meant wisdom. I thought, you know, it had some kind of a wisdom thing, to ring the bell or cutting through ignorance. So I went to my Tibetan friend, I said, can I just ask you this stupid question? What does it mean when you hear a bell in Tibetan music? And he said, it means peace comes into the world. I'd never heard that. How could he know that? I, don't, I have no idea. Okay, final one. He's six, this is two years ago, and this is significant, I forgot to mention it, because my mom passed away two years ago. Okay? Two years ago, I sat my kids down to say, you know, the next time you see Grandma, you're not, she, she's not going to look like Grandma. She won't be Grandma. They had called to tell me, you know, your mom's not going to make it for the weekend. Could you come back? Of course. I've been going back to see her every month. Concert pianist played an hour the last day of her life. I mean, just an amazing person. But I said to my kids, listen, guys, next time you see Grandma, it won't be Grandma. And RJ, can I grab that, that water bottle? Thanks. RJ says, Dad, oh, there's one right there. Dad, it's okay. Spirit is like water. Watch. And then he stops on it. 
And then he jumps up and down in this bottle, two feet at a time. My wife and I look at each other like, what the heck is he doing? It was like half empty. Smash, smash, smash. Crushes it. Makes this bottle deform until it's crushed completely. And he picks up the bottle and holds it up to me and says, you see, the water is okay. Easily the most profound teaching of the human spirit I've ever witnessed. No matter all the stuff you're going to go through, all the difficulties, those difficulties your loved ones go through, the phoenix is okay. The water is okay. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>